you'll find Philippians chapter 1, the Holy Spirit will call us to focus our attention on verses 1 through 6 this morning. The title of this message is Gratitude for Gospel Saints. Gratitude for Gospel Saints. In my quiet time this morning, I just felt like we needed to read the whole letter. I had not planned on doing that. So we'll focus on verses one through six and I've shortened up some things uh, that I had prepared to say, but I think it's important that we hear, hear God's word more than we hear man's words. And so we'll read the entire letter. As something of a preface to it, I thought it'd be good to go back in time to the first century for a moment. Specifically, first century Philippi. And what I've done is recorded a conversation, fictitious of course, between Carrie and I, as if we were in the first century in Philippi. It goes something like this. I stopped by the grocery to get those items for you, I told Carrie once I got home. Guess who I saw there? Who, Carrie asked. The prison warden, the jailer. Guess what he told me? What, Carrie asked as she was multitasking. Epaphroditus arrived today and he has a letter from the Apostle Paul. We had been waiting for months to hear back from Epaphroditus. We sent him as a congregation to give a generous care package to the Apostle Paul some time ago. Paul was in jail in Rome, as you know, but since then we've heard very little. Carrie stopped what she was doing. That's wonderful, she exclaimed. We had very little to give that month, but we gave what we could. And I've been wondering if it even got to Paul at all. So what's the plan? Will we have a specially called meeting? Will they read it on Sunday? Will they read the letter? What's next? Well, being so late in the week, the overseers and deacons thought it best to read it Sunday morning when we gather for worship, I told her. Oh, I can't wait, she said. I can't wait to hear how Paul is holding up. By the way, I bumped into Lydia today and something was bothering her. We talked about it a while and she asked you and I to pray about it. What was it, I asked. It's Euodia and Syntyche, Carrie explained. There's still friction between those two ladies. I don't even know what the issue is, but they've been at odds for some time now. Lydia doesn't know what started it either, but she's concerned it's beginning to escalate and affect the congregation. And it is. I don't even know how to act around them. It makes it awkward for everyone with all this tension in the air. Yes, I told Carrie, I've heard some rumblings about it too here and there. I don't get it either. Both of those ladies are such wonderful servants. But I figured it was none of my business, so I've stayed away from it. Yep, said Carrie, that's the way men are. But the women want to know the details. So for the next couple of weeks, the days seemed to drag on forever. A letter from the Apostle Paul himself is big news. I mean, everywhere, everyone knows that Paul caused quite a stir when he came to Philippi, Philippi in the first place. The city leaders imprisoned him, beat him, and once they found out he was a Roman citizen, they sheepishly apologized and asked him to leave town. The next news that we heard, Paul had caused an uproar both in Thessalonica and then in Corinth. We heard that he had caused a riot in Ephesus, and then we heard that he was arrested in Jerusalem. He's becoming something of a celebrity in the media now, at least in these parts, but we know Paul's heart. Paul is a law keeper, not a law breaker. His incarceration is nothing more than politics as usual. Still, it will bring great clarity to hear from him directly about what truly is happening with his case. Finally, Sunday came. 
Before worship started, the overseers and and deacons shared that Epaphroditus was back and that he had brought a letter from Paul and Timothy. Epaphroditus stood up, shared briefly about his travels, his near-death experience with illness, his recovery, but he said what he really wanted to do was get to the letter as quickly as possible. He unrolled the scroll and began reading. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my power and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, 
you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am poured, to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I, may, uh, so that I too may be cheered by news of you, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your minister and minister to my need, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. 
To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, Stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you all. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of uh, being, now not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To God, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful little letter. How encouraging it was to them, but also to us. That you will supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory. That though we encounter difficulties, you have surrounded us with a great cloud of witnesses in heaven and also a great cloud of witnesses here on earth in local congregations to, to help us band together and couple our resources so that we might be a, a furtherance of your kingdom rather than a hindrance to it. And Lord, help us as we think about the, our gratitude for one another and for gospel saints. Help us to express that in meaningful and biblical ways to one another. This is our prayer in the name of the preeminent King, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I had not planned on reading uh, the entire letter this morning, so I'm going to do some cutting and pasting in my brain. And if my thoughts seem scattered, it's because I'm cutting things and pasting things. And if I repeat myself, it's for the same reason. But Paul going back to the first six verses, really expresses two main points. Uh, one is to speak spiritual blessings freely, and the second one is to say thank you often. And I'd like to just uh, talk about those two points very briefly, and, and then we can call it a day for today. Speak spiritual blessings freely, verses one and two. There's several points that are noteworthy. I want to call your attention to them because as uh, the letter unfolds, these uh, points of interest will, will uh, spread out and, and become more visible to you. The first point is uh, Paul is the author. We often say Paul's letter to the Philippians, but there's, it's actually a, a dual author. It's Paul and Timothy. There's a reason for that. Paul was nearing the end of his ministry. He was in jail, didn't know if he was going to get out. And he seemed to be in this letter and about four or five of his other letters, uh, passing the torch to Timothy, 
passing the torch to the next generation. He, he was preparing his audiences in this letter, and again, you can go back and look in several others, uh, to, to listen to Timothy's advice and experience and his pastoral insights. The second point that's interesting to note is Paul does not identify himself as an apostle in this letter. Most of his other letters he does. There's a reason for that. Paul's writing to encourage here, uh, not to command. And in most of the other letters, he's addressing uh, problems in churches, and he's using his, his apostolic authority as a stamp uh, to give it some extra weight. He didn't need to do that to the Philippians. He's writing as a fellow co-laborer with them. The third thing, which I think is extremely important, is that Paul... Uh, his worldview was predicated upon a two-kingdom concept. Paul saw the world as you were either in the devil's world system or you were in Christ's kingdom. There was no in-between. You were in one or the other. You couldn't be in one and the other. It was only one or the other. And it comes out in phrases like this in verse 1. To all the saints... In Christ Jesus at Philippi. Now, that might not mean that much to you, but in Colossians, Martin Lloyd Jones recognized that Paul was emphasizing a point here. He said the same thing in Christ Jesus at Colossae. And here's the point that he's emphasizing you are either in Christ or you are in the world system. There's no both and. You are in Christ, you have been extricated from the world system and you have been implanted or enrooted in Christ. And you are at the world system. Your body uh, might dwell in the world system, but you live in Christ. It's an extremely important point because what most Christians today fail to recognize in our country, I'm speaking of our country, as I look on the television, they look at it this way. I am a saint in Christ Jesus in Philippi. You most certainly are not. You are a saint in Christ Jesus and you happen to be residing at Philippi. That's an important distinction that will play itself out in the letter. The fourth important point to note is the congregation had developed and organized themselves. In the opening, it says that this is addressed to the overseers and the deacons. So when Paul left them, all you had was, was a jailer and his family who had converted. And you had a, a Lydia, a, a lady who sold purple goods and, and dyed goods, and her family were believers. And maybe a few others that we pick up on along the way. But you certainly didn't have any structure. You didn't have any church structure. We're now about five years later when he writes this letter and you have overseers and you have deacons. So the church had carried on the ministry and had actually began to organize themselves and govern themselves and, and we call it ecclesiology. They had, they had become ecclesiastical because they were carrying on the ministry of the gospel. That showed up in overseers and deacons. The word overseer is the word episkopos and that's where the Episcopals take their uh, denominational name. It's from their leadership structure. Um, we see as Baptists, overseers, elders, and pastors all as describing the same office, that that is one office, and those three terms are describing different functions of that office. So we as Baptists would say, uh, that Paul could just as easily have said with the elders and deacons or with the pastors and deacons, but he chose to say with the overseers and deacons because he was addressing certain managerial functions within this church, uh, especially the reconciling of the two ladies. And so he was calling out that specific responsibility within the elder body, as it were. The other term he uses is deacons. This is the Greek word diakonoi. Uh, we need to talk about deacons in our age. This was not an issue when Paul wrote, but in our age, we've uh, encountered the idea of, of women deacons. 
And certainly in the Bible, we find an example in Rome of a woman named Phoebe who was identified by Paul as a deacon. What's going on here is that deacon can be used in two ways. There's a general term for deacon, which really is all believers. The word deacon means servant. And all believers in some sense are servants. If you're a five-year-old believer or a 95-year-old believer, if you're a male or a female, you are a deacon of God. You are a servant of God in the general sense. By the time Paul writes Philippians, the church is beginning to take on more and more structure. And what has happened is there are more needs in the church than there are uh, leaders to meet those needs. So the churches would would set apart a special office of men called deacons who would oversee the meeting of those physical needs so that the elders could handle the spiritual and focus their attention on specifically prayer and the ministry of the Word of God. Uh, Paul later would codify that concept in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, he probably wrote 1 Timothy a few months or, or maybe a year or so after he wrote Philippians. But by then, he describes that deacons are to be the husband of one wife, which tells us these are male-only deacons. And all of the, pronoun, the personal pronouns he uses are in the masculine, so he's referring to to male deacons. So you've got general deacons who include male and female, and then you have what we would call in our church context, the deacon body. Those would be male only according to Paul's uh, codification of that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. So the, the, the bigger point though, all of that is interesting stuff, but the bigger point is this congregation was doing well because they had began to take on structure. They were being deliberate about how they were furthering the kingdom of God. And then the last point, which is really the main point, is Paul issues a prayer blessing upon them. It's two words, grace and peace. We don't do this very often. Um, people might think you're a little bit strange if you do it, but I'm gonna make the best case right here and right now to take away the strangeness, okay? Have you ever cast a prayer blessing upon someone? You should. I'm not saying you're in sin if you haven't, but I'm saying you should. It's a biblical concept. Paul casts grace upon them and peace blessings upon them. And what he's saying is grace is, is getting what you don't deserve. He's, he's saying God has given you saving grace and I'm casting sanctifying, that God, God would sanctify you with his grace even more. And also peace, you had been at war with God, now you're at peace with God and I'm praying that you have more and more peace with God. You know, one of my good friends is, is a man named Larry Adams. He's the pastor at Mount Zion Baptist uh, just across the way from us. He and I talk a good bit. And every time I see him in person or every time I talk with him on the telephone, he never fails to end that conversation without speaking a spiritual blessing upon me. He does it as an encouragement. And it's not empty words that he's speaking. He, he truly means it. He'll say something like, Pastor Chip, before we leave, I know uh, that you've got to go, but I just want to pray a blessing upon you. And I said, yes, sir. And if you know Larry Adams, when he starts pronouncing a blessing, he really starts pronouncing a blessing. And he said, I pray that the Lord would make his face shine upon you and that he would have his hand upon you. And that he would make you the good father to your children. And that he would make you the good example. That you would put truth into those children. And that those children would rise up to be mighty warriors for his kingdom's sake. And he'd go on and on like this for a matter of uh, two minutes or three minutes. And, and when he gets done, I said, well, uh, I'd like to pray. I, I've never done this before, but I'd like to pray a, a blessing upon you. And he said, okay, and I don't know what in the world I said, but I prayed a blessing upon him. Whatever I said, it was good. It was real good. 
And we ought to do this with one another, you know. Paul prayed these blessings. And when you get down to the psychological element of it, this is a spiritual thing. But, but we are body, spirit creatures. And, and what Pastor Adams was doing was encouraging me to be the good husband, the godly husband. He was encouraging me to be the good father, the godly father. And I'm not apt to be the good husband, and my nature is not to be the good father, but those blessings encourage me and push me and, and, and provide a template for me to go in that direction. And so there's, there is a, a spiritual, psychological element to it. But whatever the reasons, it doesn't really matter. We just do it because it's biblical. And maybe it's awkward. But I just took away the wall of awkwardness, so all of us should be pronouncing some blessings upon one another. The second thing is to say thank you often. This is self-explanatory. Uh, Paul is, in essence, this is a thank you note, rather long one. It took me like 20 minutes to read it. But it's a thank you note. that He had received a gift from them, and he was thanking them for his, their partnership, verse 4. I'll mention one verse and then we'll call it a day. I mention it because you know this verse, it's verse six. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You've heard this verse. Oftentimes we apply it to ourselves that he who began a good work in you, he will complete it. And certainly that's a, that's a proper application. But in its strictest context, he's speaking to, to the congregation as a whole. The you is plural, if you look at it in the original. And what he's saying is, um, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in the congregation at Philippi will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to pick up on this verse, the reason I wanted to mention it, in chapter 2, verse 13, and he's going to apply it to the individual in your conversion. Uh, he says, therefore, it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Same concept, he just applies it to the individual. Here, it's to the congregation. And I couldn't help but think, First Baptist Church of Springville was constituted in 1817 A.D., he who began a good work in 1817 A.D. in you will complete it until the day or at the day of Jesus Christ. All of those who preceded us in this city and in this constituted organization, all of those ministries, all of those monies, all of those efforts, every single one of them will be come fully completed at the day of Jesus Christ. All those souls that have been saved for 200 years will receive the glorified body at the day of Jesus Christ and all will be made known. And that's important because all of the monies that you give generously and all of the effort that you put in generously and all of the ministries that you faithfully play out from the children's ministry to the nursery area to to the youth to the senior adult ministry to the ministries to the community that we do every single one of them not one godly deed will be left undone it will all come to completion at the day of our Lord Jesus Christ that's important and that ought to keep us going it ought to keep us going longer and stronger Paul knew that every person who contributed to that care package that was delivered to him, that that care package was going to be used to send the gospel from Rome all over the world and that they were having a part in a great harvest that will occur at a future date and time. Well, speak spiritual blessings freely and say thank you often. What's the timeless principle in this paragraph? Gospel saints can accomplish more together than we can apart, can't we? What's 
Paul saying? He's saying the Philippian congregation came together, they pooled their resources, they coupled their resources, and they sent it to him for the furtherance of kingdom interests. And in fact, the imperial guard had been penetrated with the gospel of Jesus Christ because Paul was in prison and because they, their gift helped sustain him while he was there. If God did that in past times, how can he use each of us as we pool together our talents and our resources? Probably in ways we will never imagine. Probably in ways we will never comprehend. Well, as we close this morning, we could glean a lot of truths from this text, but let's just stay where Paul focused. Speak spiritual blessings upon someone this week and say thank you often this week. Make it a point to reach out to those who work behind the scenes, who make things go, who make things operate. Make it a point. You say, well, I don't know who they are. Open your eyes. Begin looking around. Start asking questions. Who opens the door? Who has umbrellas to walk the elderly to the car when it might be raining? Who picks up the trash in the pews after the service? Who is ministering to our children over here? Who's volunteering in the nursery over here uh, so that parents can worship without uh, being hindered? Who is doing all these things? What are their names? Where are their faces? And make it a point to go to those people and speak spiritual blessings upon them freely and to say thank you to them often. We don't do that often enough. I'd like to just say in your own family, uh, children, if I could speak to you just for a moment, if you'll look up at me just for a moment. Tell your parents thank you. You say, for what? What did I say thank you for? They told me to clean my room. Well, say thank you. Because a lot of children don't have parents. And a lot of children don't have the Christian parents that you have. And it's good, even if you don't know why you're thanking them, just to say, Mom, thank you. Thank you for being my mom. Dad, thank you. And parents, if I can talk to you just for a moment, say thank you to your children. The Lord uh, bothered me, disturbed me this week because I was thinking about this and I said, well, I don't need to say thank you to my children. They need to say thank you to me. They don't provide anything for me except grief, typically. <laughs> And then I thought, they provide more than that. These are blessings from the Lord. I find myself correcting them, instructing them, encouraging them, warning them, but I don't find myself thanking them. Thanking them for being a blessing from the Lord. Thanking them that God gave you to me to steward and to raise and then to send out for his kingdom's sake and to, to grow and expand his kingdom. And so parents, it would do us uh, good to just take a, a time aside with each of our children, not all of them at once, but each one individually and say, thank you, you're a blessing from the Lord and I'm so glad that he let, allowed me to be your parent. In all of your blessing and all of your thanking, don't forget this, Thank God for them, for it is Him working in them to will and to work for His good pleasure. And I think if every single one of us found one person and we, we spoke a blessing upon them and we said thank you to them, that our congregation would be stronger, not weaker, for having done that. So I'd like to ask you to do that, and I think everyone will. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this reminder, and what a blessing to be in a congregation with such wonderful gospel saints, people who come faithfully week by week, who serve faithfully week by week, 
and who desire to use their life to further your kingdom and your kingdom's interests. Help us to express what we all have in our heart for one another. We sometimes have problems saying it or writing it or expressing it. And so our prayer this morning is that we follow Paul's model here and write out a thank you or say a thank you or express it in some tangible way so that your bride will be made stronger and will be in a better position to strengthen others. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.